I'll introduce myself to start. My name is Sophie and I am the vice president of the Film Pool Board this uh, year. And I am really excited to be joined by um, four very talented filmmakers um, that are nominated in the feature and web series category for the CIFAs this year. Um, we're joined with Gavin Baird, who is nominated for his feature film, The Caring Only Cry at Night. Um, Amber Goodwin, who is nominated for uh, her web series, Porous. Greg Hargarden, who is nominated for his uh, web series, Adventures in Painting. And Dustin Halati, who is nominated for his feature film, Nolan Here Nor There. So welcome everybody and thanks for joining me this evening. Um, I guess to start us off, I would just, um, you know, like for us to go around and tell us a little bit about your project and maybe how it came to fruition. So Dustin, you're unmuted. Why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, so uh, our film is called Nolan Here Nor There. And uh, it's a story about a, it's a coming of age story that takes place partly on um, on a reserve and then partly in Fort Coppell. And um, and it kind of all got, I, I, don't, I don't really remember what was like first kind of pushed it off, but I, I it all kind of started from uh, uh, some partnerships I made with uh, Wilfred Dieter and um, Jeremy Ratzlaff and, and we kind of, uh, I had, I kind of pitched them an idea and they liked it. And so I wrote a script and we were kind of off the races. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, what about yourself, Greg? Um, well, uh, I paint with a group of uh, plein air painters called the Men Who Paint. And for the last mm, 10 or 12 years, we've been traveling all over the country and abroad uh, painting. There's five of us. Um, in 2011, we were invited to go to the Yukon um, to paint at Ivavik National Park. Uh, so we went there and we stayed in tents for 10 days and painted the area. And uh, we all took video cameras and all that because it was, uh, you know, very remote area. Um, and when we got back, I edited it into a half hour little feature thing uh, that aired on Shaw. And that really got me thinking about an ongoing sort of mini series of of our adventures. So um, over the course of the next, that sort of fermented for a while. And then over the course of the next few years, I, I started uh, filming us when we we're in the field and making short little 15, 10, 15 minute uh, episodes. Oh, awesome. That's really, that's really cool. Um, what about you, Gavin? Um... Well, I'm, on this project, I was working for the script on the script since I finished film school in the beginning of 2016. So it's taken a long time. And then we were lucky enough to get the Creative Sask micro budget uh, feature film grant. And then we filmed it May 2019 uh, for like 14 days. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your project? Um, it's the Caring Only Cry at Night is the title. Um, it's basically about um, this section of the government that uh, transports sick and elderly people into remote locations and abandon them there um, because they've been deemed no longer useful to society. So it's a pretty dark comedy. It's a comedy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I feature. thought of it as a comedy. I mean, <laughs> some people I talk to don't find it funny. No, of course. Yeah. And uh, what about yourself, Amber? Um, so the question was like, uh, could you, sorry, could you say the question again? I was just about to give you my bio. <laughs> <laughs> so just tell us a little bit about your project, maybe how it okay. came to fruition. Yeah. For sure. Um, so my, my project is called Porous. It's, um, it's a, an episodic experimental sci-fi feminist musical. Um, I'm a, 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 what do you call it now? A multidisciplinary artist. And my main practice over the last few years has been um, sort of this experimental synth pop music project. 
and uh, close to the completion of the album Porous, um, I was sort of reflecting on um, sort of the already expanded universe of this music project. I have like a like a backstory to the character I perform as Natural Sympathies, you know, I have an elaborate stage show with back backup dancers and this sort of thing. And it's a very over the top fun project. And uh, I also have a film uh, background. I was trained formally as a filmmaker and I am still a filmmaker. And um, so I thought it would be really fun to set the, the, set, the seven songs to, um, I, to make a film out of the seven songs. And um, so I kind of worked as a producer and writer and um, I wrote a concept that, uh, that uh, and, 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 and sorry, and incorporated um, seven director teams to um, direct each song segment of the film um, in their particular style. Um, and I was really honored that these different filmmakers um, were able to come in and sort of um, apply their talent and process to each of those, those songs and, uh, and, and to build a film together, almost like an exquisite corpse, you know? So we had different um, set pieces and uh, motifs that reoccurred throughout the songs that sort of visually tied things together. But outside of that, it was uh, pretty experimental, pretty poetic and uh, in its logic. And um, yeah, came together in six frantic months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody has a, a similar feeling towards parts of their project being slightly frantic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess that kind of leads into um, another question I have for all of you. What is something that you learned or an important lesson or thing that you would take forward with you into your next project that you learned from this project that you um, are nominated for for the CIFAs. So I don't know if anyone has an idea right off the top of their head, or I might just pick someone. <laughs> mm. uh, well, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll just continue for a second. Yeah, go I would give myself more time. <laughs> um, I yeah, um, I had but the project was ambitious, and uh, and I'm I'm always a little bit on the ambitious side, but. Um, I generally usually take a lot of time, like writing a song, I take a year, I just sing the melody for the longest time until the next part of the melody builds. And then mm -hmm. I eventually record it and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, just always uh, giving yourselves um, more budget and time than you think you need because always uh, that comes in handy. I was just telling, I was just visiting in a class today and it was just the same thing. It's That's the number one takeaway for me. Um, Sometimes I think that young emerging filmmakers or artists um, think it looks more professional if you can guarantee that a product can be produced in three months, for example, you know, or in a short timeline as if it were a, like proof of their ability to do a thing. But I think, um, you know, for example, granting uh, agencies and uh, juries of different kinds will appreciate the creative process and the proper amount of time a thing takes. Um, so, yeah. No, I think that's a really great lesson. Can, can I go next? Go for it, absolutely. Okay, I'll go next. <laughs> um, I'd say for me, a thing I learned, um, completing a film does like, probably like from the first idea you have until, you know, all the editing's done and you're sending it off to film festivals and that. Um, I, I'd say like I learned uh, the biggest tool that probably uh, anyone could have is just um, perseverance and uh, just pressing through when no one else believes in it anymore and pressing through when it's hard and pressing through when you want to quit. There's like so many exit ramps you could take along the way uh, to not finishing it. And there's so many reasons not to finish a film. And uh, at least I, that's what, that was my experience. I was like a hundred times I had like, uh, we could just, you know, kind of step off here or, or, and, and I think, and you might have people in your life that give you like horrible advice. Like people who gave me horrible advice that said stuff like, well, just turn your full length film into a short film or, or short, turn it into a sizzler or whatever. You know, I just think if you have perseverance, you can make it happen. It, it doesn't mean it's going to happen quickly. Like I think from uh, the first envisioning of our film to today was like two or three years. So it, it it takes a long time and, and being consistent uh, and I'm not bad at being consistent, but 
I decided I was going to be consistent about this, and I, th I think it, I think, and I think it paid off. So, um, yeah. So I just say, like, outside of anything else, or you know, money or talent or whatever, persistence is probably the most important. I would say. I, I think I would definitely agree with that, and I think you, like, I'm fairly new to the making of films or whatever, but. Um, you know, I've done creative projects for years and I, it does take a lot of self strength and persistence to finish them. And it takes, uh, it, it's good if you can break it down into smaller pieces and accomplish little pieces at a time. So you, you know, get a, a little bit of a sense that you're moving forward yeah. because if you try and tackle all like, you know, with any project, there's a million little items that need to be attended to, um, Sometimes it, it, they have to go in a certain order, uh, but even if they don't, I find that if you can focus on finishing one at a time, as opposed to having all these unfinished things, if you finish one little thing at a time, you feel like you're moving forward and that, that helps with your persistent issues, persistence issue perhaps. Mm -hmm. No, I like, I like that. Gavin, do you have any thoughts on the, persistence or lessons that you learned maybe on your project that you'd like to add? Um, well, the biggest thing I realized was this was our first feature with like a full length script. Like it was like 70 some odd pages. And I realized that I don't like working like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when we were like in production and we had to shoot like, I don't know so many pages a day it was like great I had a great time but it's just like there's like no time to just like wander off when we're filming and that's like my favorite part so I'm I'm still like figuring out how I like to make films but I definitely don't want to make one with a full-length script again <laughs> to me like the perfect you're making a 75 minute thing that script needs to be like 30, 35 pages. And that's just, <laughs> that's the spot for it. That's like, you film three pages and then you just kind of, I don't know. What are you doing let, when you're wandering? Let It's just like, you just like, I don't know. I can't even explain it, but it's like the best feeling. It's like, you're just like searching around for stuff, like getting dreamy, like having fun with it. Yeah. And I realized like trying to work in, I guess, a more like classical or structured way, it like kind of takes that away from from it. Huh. Yeah. Your films do seem like they're fun to make. I mean, I have fun on them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah every time I see them, I'm like, that looks really fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um... I guess, Gavin, I have a more specific question for you, kind of getting into the, the films itself. So your film, obviously, as you're giving this synopsis of it, takes kind of an interesting spin on a sort of taboo type subject. What drew you to approach the subject in the first place? Well, the, it's, um, the initial idea was for me, I, w I wanted to challenge myself and try and make like a Western and then after over time it like morphed and it's not a western at all <laughs> but the first image i had was like um this guy in a car dropping off this elderly woman with a bag over her head in the middle of nowhere and i thought wow that's like quite an image and i'd like to see that movie <laughs> um but then as it like i don't know i just became interested in like um how in society um, people often put the elderly in old folks homes and then um, well basically like and never visit them or see them and to me it's like in this alternate reality um, this is just another option and it's I guess a similar option in that and one that I think people if they had the option might choose just because it seems like a an easier and cheaper way out, which I don't know, I find really sad. Yeah, I, I, I think sad is a good word. I would agree with that. 
Um, Amber, so your project, music is obviously the driving factor of this, um, this uh, web series following all of these different songs. How would you say that music shapes your creative process when making films specifically? Uh, like I'm going to sound like I'm just saying this, but honestly, uh, most of my films previously were silent films. Oh. Uh, yeah, because I'm usually the person, uh, there would usually be um, experimental, uh, sort of more narr um, diaristic type films. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of always working on different projects all the time and one uh, line of inquiry leads to another. Um, so, so yeah, um, so music doesn't actually you often inspire my, my filmmaking at all. Um, and this is the first time they've ever really met other than just, you know, um, working with somebody for a music video for a band that I'm in or something. Um, and, uh, and when, you know, and I'm pretty care careful about that kind of thing. Like I, I care a lot about uh, the visual world that I paint around a music project. Um, but I'm also working on a film, like a, a, a narrative film script right now um, that really doesn't have much to do, anything to do with, um, with, uh, with music. Um, and without kind of talking about it because it's too early to do so, the idea for that had to do with just moral questions about whether um, somebody could ever choose the right thing for somebody else. You know, sometimes people are very well-intentioned and... Um, they want they they think they know what's best for somebody who is struggling, and uh, I'm just always I'm always curious about that why somebody thinks that they would know better than somebody else, and often um, they just they just can't see who they they truly are and that sort of thing. Um, so I've got an actual compelling story, not just like a moral tale around that. I think it's compelling. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm working on that. Um, you know what really inspires my my work, like Forrest, is that um, and my my music. As I think, maybe I'm just a frustrated writer, to be honest. Like I, that sounds like I'm doing everything. Maybe I'm a bit of, like maybe I spread myself too thin across different styles. But I always feel like the time's running out all the time. I talk a lot about time, but um, so I always write. I always have like words that come first in any creative project. In any creative creative project, really, just like. Um, the ideas come first as words, like turns of phrase or a poem. I read a lot. I don't watch a lot of TV, that kind of thing to do. So, yeah. Oh, that's that's really cool to hear um, a little bit of insight into that creative process of yours. Um, Greg, I have a question for you. How did the medium of painting affect the way that you shot um, your piece? Because watching even just a little bit of it, you can eat, like some of the shots look themselves just like painting. So I'm curious if painting kind of played a part in the way that you shot this project. Well, um, visually, uh, the difference between painting and especially plein air or landscape painting and uh, photography, uh, I don't really think there's too much, a lot of it relies on the composition. So, mm -hmm. um, when I have the chance, you know, I, we're hiking, we're, we're moving a lot. So I, I, you know, got my gear with me and it's not uh, state of the art gear. Um, but I do try to compose the shots in the same way that I would compose a painting. Uh, you know, a composition is everything mm -hmm. when it comes to painting. And so I, I guess I kind of uh, take that approach. I, I don't even necessarily, I don't think I think about it really consciously because I've been a painter and a graphic designer for so long. I, I just kind of typically, or I just sort of think in those terms. Um, but when I find myself consciously thinking of framing the shot is generally because of the composition and that comes from my painting and design backgrounds, I guess. Absolutely. And what, um... I guess like what composition or what about the composition really matters to either a painting or a um, image? Is there anything that really stands out? Anything that, you know, any rules you might follow or anything like that? I'm curious. Well, it's funny because I've been a designer and a painter for uh, 30 years, 25, 30 years. And only recently, like within the last five that I find out about what's called the rule of thirds in photography. 
I really had no, I, I just did it somewhat intuitively. Um, but you know, it's, it's like painting. Uh, once you learn some of those things, it helps you identify what's wrong with your composition much quick, much quicker, right? Mm -hmm. Where before it might be a bit of pulling back and forth, trying to figure out how the shot or painting or whatever should look. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, Dustin, so your project is very set in Saskatchewan, obviously, um, pulling on some key uh, locations. So how did the backdrop of Saskatchewan shape this project for you? Um, well, so, for, yeah, for sure, like, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to dedicate my life to um, telling stories set in Saskatchewan and, and based in Saskatchewan, just because I think we have a really interesting culture uh, interesting cultures and um it's not romanticized very often you know I, I i think we need to romanticize uh the prairies a little a little more you know america's got like their the south that's been romanticized in like so many books and movies and things and so i so that's kind of like my my bent like i don't really want to tell stories that are set anywhere else and so um and so for that so my first, so when I started making films, my first film was about, um, you know, a, a young uh, uh, a woman who was married uh, at a very young age. And then she was, uh, you know, her husband was kind of like, you know, believed a little too hard on specific gender roles, uh, which I think is a very specific to Saskatchewan thing. So uh, and then, and then it wasn't long before I realized like it's it's you can't really say you want to tell Saskatchewan stories without um, diving into uh, the treaty relationship and and colonization and all those things. And so, yeah, I, I, for me it was just that I don't think you could have I don't think I could have called myself uh, a filmmaker that wants to tell Saskatchewan stories without going into that and. And uh, initially, I, th I, you know, I was in a class, an Indigenous Studies class at U of R, and we took a trip out to Fort Quipel. And you know, a lot of uh, the people that show up in the script are based on real people, and 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 people people I met, uh, residential school survivor, the uh, the the class, the um, reconciliation class was was a real class uh, based out of Fort Quipel. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually lost their funding and the and the program ended the the year that we the September after we filmed um so yeah so for me it's like Saskatchewan specifically is just linked will always be linked to anything I do so mm -hmm. for this particular project was it was it the drive to tell a Saskatchewan based story or did the story itself uh, and the characters come first um I think it always starts with kind of just a interesting idea or 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 like um like for me I really um because I was you know I was uh in the indigenous studies class so I was learning a lot of things and I just uh and originally I'd written the script as it was like uh, a guy like me um kind of like going out to Fort Capel and kind of it was way more autobiographical uh, and then I thought, like, no one wants to watch a guy in his 30s learn things. Like, that's not that's not fun. <laughs> and so I thought it would be better as a coming of age story. So then I made him younger. Um, and then it was just like, I don't know if that really works, because then it's like, it's like kind of like this, you know, kind of white kid just learning about another culture. I thought it'd be stronger if it was like, uh, uh, if it was someone uh, learning about their own culture. And so, so that was kind of that was kind of like, you know, how that came about. But. Hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, I guess kind of a question for everybody here that kind of piggybacks off of that one. Um, what is it like to make art, movies, film, painting, music, uh, or what's it like to be a creative person in Saskatchewan? Pretty great. You got all winter to work on your craft. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got some isolation, hibernation. Yeah. Although, you know, I, I, I'm a musician as well, and I, I, I played in bands for years and years, and the winter is not very much fun for traveling around and playing shows. Um, 
but I think that I think that that has a lot to do with uh, there's a lot of art uh, and artists artists and artisans in Saskatchewan, and I think that the weather has a great deal to do with that. Um, there's tons of painters and potters and filmmakers and musicians, and uh, you know when you're sort of can't go not willing to go outside for uh, eight months of the year or seven months of the year, you you find other things to do. <laughs> yes, that is a great way to put it. I've never thought of it quite like that, but that is a great way to put it. What about anyone else? What's it like to make a film in Saskatchewan or make art in Saskatchewan? Um, I, I also, I'll say a few words. Um, I am from Montreal, actually. I moved here about eight years ago. Uh, my partner is originally from Saskatchewan. We moved back here. Um, and uh, and I have to say that something um, that's always been so incredible to me is the direct the the access you have to um, other artists. Um, just to other artists, I should just that's enough. But like just like all different kinds of artists, like in terms of their career, like there's just some pretty heavy hitting, you know. Um, artists who like have just inc like incredible work um who are like fairly accessible you can maybe ask somebody for their phone number you know what I mean like that's not like something that you that happens much in like in a much more densely populated place with with like a longer history of uh you know I don't know colonization like maybe um and then also um and also just uh, just like di different kinds of density. There's also it's there's like it's easier to access arts grants here. Um, it's a it's much it's much different than it is in uh, out east. That's for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, like on Porous, it's a short film. Um, I collaborated with over twenty five different artists, all from here, um, professional and uh, and um, an amateur or whatever, and uh, emerging. And um, it was just, it was, it came together so quickly. And I just don't know if I could have done that if there was, there were some of those professionals who were booked like a year and a half out or something just because of the way the, the system, the film, everything works, you know? Um, that's a really, that's a really shallow reading of that, but it's just, it's more of a feeling than anything, just sort of like something I noticed almost as soon as I, as I moved here. Um, I think sometimes in Saskatchewan, people don't, take their work seriously enough. Um, they get kind of comfortable. And there's something nice about that too. Like um, sometimes I'm like, who am I making my work for? And as I get older, more it's it's really for my my friends or the people who I see in real life um, rather than trying to reach this huge audience or something, you know? Um, but at the same time, I do miss sometimes being in Montreal and having touring bands come through more often from to other cities doing new things all the time. Um, or like touring artists, uh, we we do get artists and bands and people visiting, but not at the not the same way. And I do miss that. And um, and I think yeah. So there's this also. So what I'm trying to say is there's like this balance of being pretty comfortable where you are at, um, and sometimes that comfort makes us a bit more relaxed. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we're all learning that we should just chill out <laughs> or something right now. But. Um, I, I think there's some people who aren't driven to make their work, you know, professionally present their work. And um, and sometimes I wish they would. And then sometimes I think I should learn from them more. Not that I'm like the most professional person out there or something, but it's just this like something I've got instilled in me from, I think, back home, you know. Hmm. Further to that, I think that uh, my experience with music and art, certainly I, I'm new to filmmaking and filmmakers, but uh, my experience in the other disciplines is that the Prairie people are very supportive of each other. And I know from being in Vancouver and Toronto that that is just not the case in other places. It's a lot more, I don't know, cutthroat or something. And the, pe the people just don't, don't support their competition, you know, and you definitely don't get that feeling on the, in, on the prairies, especially in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, Gavin or Dustin, any thoughts on making films in Saskatchewan? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm pointing to you on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I love making films in Saskatchewan. I think it's great. Uh, um, no, I, yeah. Like the, my favorite thing to look forward to is just when am I going to make another project with, you know, the, I guess, great family of people we've kind of assembled over the past few years. And I don't know. Yeah. It's just, I'd have a hard time imagining you could stretch your dollar further anywhere else. And on top of it's like, I don't know, all the people I make, we make the films with are like our best friends. So it's just, yeah, it's the dream. You know, I wish I was filming right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait till I can again. Like, I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. I kind of started looking, when I look back at like the films we've done, it's like even less so about the final product, but it's more about the experiences making them. Like, cause we've kind of done like at least like one bigger project a year. And now I kind of look back at them like almost like a scrapbook where I like remember like, oh, that day, like read our like location audio guy, like we had Burger King after the shoot, you know, and we had like this great time or like, I don't know, stuff like that. It's, uh, it's great though. Yeah, I don't know if that answered anything. No, I think that's great. It's proven, you know, that sense of community in, in Saskatchewan, just kind of iterating. I think what everyone else has kind of said, Dustin, any last thoughts on the sure. yeah. Saskatchewan, I guess? I agree with Gavin. I think Saskatchewan is the best place to make films. <laughs> uh you know in canada probably um and 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 you know like you said about i it, it might be hard to get an influx of money um i know ever you said you 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 get you're good at writing grants and i know gavin you've got a grant i'm really horrible at writing grants i i i uh i think i just can't, i filling out paperwork is just i can't handle it and i, I remember i applied for one once and i, I was like i'm just gonna like get a box of wine and like power through because I can't stand it and and then they wrote me back and they said and they were like and I said any tips I'm like I didn't get it <laughs> any any tips so I'm like uh how I can write a better grant and they're like yeah maybe don't start with I'm probably not gonna get this like <laughs> and I was like I wrote that okay I don't remember that but so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get grants but I do I do find that uh yeah it can be relatively uh, more inexpensive to to film here. I have a friend who lives in Mission, and he's always telling me to move out there. He says, "Oh, there's so much film stuff out here in BC," and but then he also tells me stories where he runs a coffee shop, and he tells me stories where, "Oh, these guys asked if I could uh, store some other film equipment at my coffee shop for the night, and they gave me a thousand dollars." And I was like, "Well, that would be like a whole budget for me." <laughs> <laughs> so, for like everything so i don't have like a thousand dollars to blow on like leaving equipment somewhere um so yeah and here i find it's super easy to get locations i just go and ask and almost every time uh you know the person is like what a movie here they're and, they, and they're thanking me and i'm just like okay sure but like it's uh yeah so it's a it's super easy to get locations um when you think of it, Saskatchewan only being a million people, uh, which is like the size of Calgary or the size of Edmonton, um, we actually got a lot of good actors here. Um, and, you know, like I don't think Edmonton or Calgary has this many good actors. So I could be wrong, but um, <laughs> but so there's there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of great actors here. There's it's easy to get locations. Um, it's easy to find people that are passionate uh, about things. You know, like. You know, I've, I've known a bunch of like kind of like big, big film set people. And I don't know if like, you know, that work in Vancouver and, and Toronto. And I don't know if like passion is like the first word I'd use to describe them. So um, I don't know. So I think it's great. Yeah. Something that you um, all really touched on talking about making films in Saskatchewan was the people that obviously you're working with or the community. Um, so how have you, as a filmmaker and artist, discovered members of your team and how do you keep the relationship with them strong? Maybe Gavin, if you want to start, because I know that you mentioned kind of working with the same group over and over and. 
Yeah, I try and, I don't know, work with the same people because I'm antisocial, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I all our crew, we just kind of met pretty naturally. Like my producing partner, Kyle, I worked at the Roxy Theater with him. And then one day we were working and he said, we should like make a Joe Swanberg type like mumblecore movie. And then that turned into the big gust. Um, and then, yeah, actually most of them I met through Reyes, which is a film school I went to in Saskatoon. And then I guess I have a good enough relationship with the school that I like kind of go in and meet everyone every um, um, like term. And then it's great because it's like I'm kind of like cherry picking like <laughs> all the cool people and then I kind of add them to the team. Um, but that's more or less how it happens. Or I don't, I can't even remember how I met you, Sophie. But it's yeah, like, I don't know, it's a pretty small community. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of, I don't know, you like, you like turn your like kind of bullshit sensor on and then you just kind of figure out like who you, who you like or who you like working with or who you don't like. And then you weed them out. I don't, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Anyone else? What, have, what are some of maybe your experiences with finding crew casts in Saskatchewan and, you know, how do you keep those relationships with those team members? Well, my situation is way different than everybody else's. My cast is always the guys I paint with. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I've been kind of pushing them to do this more because I can see a lot of benefits to it. I enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of turned them also into the crew because I've got them all filming now and they'll film themselves and, and I just put it together. I just edit it at the end. So yeah. we're just, uh, you know, we're more like-minded because of the painting rather mm -hmm. than maybe the filmmaking. Yeah. I feel like um, I need to mention that there, when I moved here, it was right after the film tax credit was, was taken away. And so a lot of people who like work in the industry had to move or had their livelihoods taken away. Mm -hmm. um, so previously when we were talking about when I kind of touched briefly upon funding, I was talking really about arts funding. I wasn't talking about, um, you know, more consistent uh, support for an industry sort of thing. So I, I don't know. I feel like I should have said that. And, I, and to that effect, also the people you work with, um, there are many people in town who are professional filmmakers or crew and that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of them have moved away. So anyway, the, I, just to say the people I work with um, are, uh, some of them have worked on, you know, features and like on TV sh shows previous to the film tax credit being um, cut. Um, but, uh, but most of them I met sort of through my contacts in the fine arts world in Regina. Um, and in the, in the music scene, like people who just made, who make music videos or people who who are film school graduates, um, who are currently teaching at the film school. Um, and uh, yeah, just through the community, because like, you know, each city is also tiny within this fairly small province mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. You get to get to know each other and, and sort of similar to Gav and it's like, I've got this bonkers idea. Do you want to join it? <laughs> just like inviting people to do it. But I mean, I, it was a bit more like thought out than that, but um, <laughs> But yeah, people are just like, you know, we were saying everyone's super supportive and they are and just like down to do it, you know, so um, not like people don't have like scruples or standards or anything like that. But just like it's just amazing that people say, say yes and put their heart and soul into it. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other thoughts, Dustin? Um, I, I also, um, like Gavin said, I, I agree with that. I try to work with uh, as many of the same people um, as possible to um, not so much because I'm antisocial, but yeah, it's like, you know, develop, if you've done it before with someone, it's, it's, it's more, it's more comfortable and, 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 and that type of thing. Like, um, 
I, I really like uh, collaborating with Jeremy Ratzlaff. We, he kind of helped me on my first short. Uh, we partnered on that and I, I kind of didn't really know anything and, and um, he really helped me out a lot. And so, so I always love when I can work with him and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess just really like, and how, how you, to maintain those relationships. It's, I just love, I love talking movies with people and, and talking art with people. And, and so I want to know, you know, what, what has turned people on to doing film and what they consider to be beautiful works of art, whether that be films or, or visual art or painting or, or, or anything. And so I find that to be a really connection point because, uh, because I used to be, I used to be like a hyper evangelical and slowly um, kind of like art kind of became my new religion in a lot of ways. And, and so, and so, you know, just getting together, talking about what we're doing, uh, talking about what other people have done, talking about what inspires us and, and talking about what, what we want to do. Um, yeah, that kind of, I find that really connecting. Mm -hmm. it feels like you're part of a larger story not just kind of stuck in your moment in your corner of the universe in your moment in history you know yeah that's really nice <clears throat> excuse me um so somebody may be watching this how does somebody who wants to make films find those groups of people or what are what are some things that maybe you did or you would recommend um somebody do to kind of find those people or to find you know, those groups of people to start making some art. Film pool? Or, it wasn't a shameless plug, but it can be. <laughs> might as well bring it up at some point. Um, I'd say like film pool and paved arts. Mm -hmm. Both good. Yeah, absolutely. Both great organizations and lots of members that are looking for other members. I think cold calling people works too. I've done that a few times and people are nice enough. Or if they're not interested, you know, maybe the worst thing. Okay. One thing I figured out is it never hurts to ask because the worst thing someone will just say no or they won't respond. And, you know, that's fine too. But at least you tried. Absolutely. I think that goes hand in hand with what um, Dustin was saying about persistence, you know, um, not necessarily like harassing people or anything like that, but just, you know, kind of having the audacity to ask or to try a thing, you know, um, but that uh, I also suggest, you know, um, just being a decent human being is really helpful, um, you know, so um, and I think I think most people are but just, you know, when you it just when you take the step to approach somebody you, you don't know or join a community to do so in a respectful, friendly way, um, just kind of like opening doors. And, um, and uh, you know, it's always helpful to have a portfolio or even not, don't even have to have something as, you know, pulled together as a portfolio, but just a sample of your work or your idea or a draft, like a, you know, um, a script idea. Um, and people come together in all different kinds of ways. Sometimes it's just pooling resources, just a couple of friends. It starts with a couple of pals being like, I've got, I've got this camera and I've got the Zoom recorder, you know, let's do a thing um, and try it out, you know? So, um, but just, uh, but yeah, and, and showing up is important too. So, you know, right now we can't gather at events, but like watching the live stream or, you know, um, taking the time to get to know the people that you're hoping to connect with or doing your research, you know, could mm -hmm. kind of be, both things yeah yeah I think that's great advice mm -hmm. Dustin or Greg any other um I'd say just if first you gotta I guess you gotta know who you need to find and to know who you need to find I guess you suppose need a lot of self-awareness and you need to know where you lack and what you suck at and um you know, if you if you're kind of going in thinking, well, I'm great at, at everything and I can do everything and I'm the best at everything. Uh, film is so collaborative, you can't really do that. Um, so, like, and I and I and I often like err. Uh, I have erred hardly, like in, in that uh, in that area. Um, you know, like 
honestly, if I could just write scripts and just give them to somebody and somebody made them, that would be like my dream. I just really enjoy writing. But, you know, if I want my scripts to turn into films in Saskatchewan, I also have to be a force pushing that, making that happen. So I end up doing a lot of things that I would never necessarily do. So sometimes I direct, I would, I'm not necessarily, that's not my main passion or anything. Um, or sometimes I produce and, and well, every time I produce. So, um, so for, for me, like it's knowing what you suck at, like I'm not good at anything technical. So I know I need to partner with people who are, uh, you know, br brilliant cinematographers who are, uh, who are great at sound. I'm, I'm really bad at all those things. I, I actually, on Nolan here nor there, I initially uh, did the post sound myself thinking, how hard can it be? And I, and I took a course online and it was so bad. And I'm so lucky that the first film festival I submitted to is Gimli Film Festival, which is like a dream festival of mine. It's where uh, Guy Madden got his start and all that. And, uh, and they sent me a message saying, we love your film, but you need someone else to do the sound or we can't, we're not going to do it. We're not going to take it. And so I was like, oh crap. And then, so I partnered, so I had a friend who uh, was good at sound and basically we trashed everything I had spent probably two straight months doing and, and, uh, and, and he redid it all. So, so yeah, from, so for me, it's like, like, having self-awareness, knowing what, what you suck at and partnering with people who have, who are strong where you're weak. Because the thing is like, they are looking for you too, because they, if they have self-awareness too, they'll know that they're weak and they need your strengths as well, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. Film is such a collaborative, I mean, art in general can be such a collaborative medium. So that's really, I really resonate with that. Greg, any thoughts to add to this one or? Well, like I, my, my experience is so different than everybody mm -hmm. else's. Uh, but I know in the other uh, areas of my life, uh, it does come down to collaboration and it does come down to one, putting yourself out there continuously and, and, mm -hmm. and constantly learning. I mean, you, you always can learn something new, something more. And um, not not taking uh, it to heart when someone tells you that the sound in your movie is what's holding it back, that's a constructive criticism and there's something you can do about that. So focus on what you can do instead of the problem and move forward by finding somebody to do it or, or whatever it takes to go jump over that hurdle. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so we're kind of nearing the end of our panel here today. I have one more question for the group here. Um, films, art projects, creative projects in general evolve as they are made. Um, Dustin obviously is a really passionate writer. I'm sure that by the time it gets to the sound mixing, it's, a, it's quite a different project than originally envisioned. So I guess I'm curious, um, was your project what you expected it to be and or maybe how did it evolve through the creative process? I think mine is continuously evolving because I'm such a noob at actually editing and the whole thing um, that hopefully I'm getting better at it. And I, you know, you'll learn by watching what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you don't really start doing that until you've tried to do it yourself and you realize how difficult it is. How did they do that? How, how did that, how does that work? And uh, then you're on a mission to find out. So um, I know during the course of this web series, uh, my, I hopefully have evolved and it, and it will continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Um, well, when I originally wrote the script um, um, to what it became, I mean, you know, I think you look at the script and look at the film and be like, yep, yeah, this is the script for that film. It's not too crazily different. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, Wilfred Dieter, who directed, uh, he put his, his own stamp on it. Um, and of course, the actors, like they are always going to take it in 
in a direction that and do things that you would have never thought of or um that, and there's a lot of there's a lot of little things in, in nolan here nor there that that uh the actors uh kind of just put their own little spin on things that were that were uh yeah just really just really amazing um so i'd say so yeah so and then and then it really really like i as a writer like i think you write the script and you really let it go um it, even if, even if you are directing the only thing, the things that you write um i think um you still got to let it go cuz cuz films are collaborative and if you're going to be too stringent then it's it's not going to be it's not going to be a collaborative project and mm -hmm. you're going to lose out so much cuz it's going to be one voice instead of a collection of voices so. No, I really like that. Um, Gavin or Amber, any? Uh... <laughs> um... I guess for you, Gavin, too, you said that this project has been a long time in the making. So I'm sure it's uh, changed a few times over the process of these years. Yeah, there were like maybe like 15 drafts of the script. And they must have been like, I don't know, maybe five times that we totally threw it out and started over. So it was like too long of a process, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I kind of feel like I only figure out like what I'm making once it's done. You, you know, like once I finally like see that like um, blah, blah, blah underscore final underscore colors <laughs> done mp4 on the laptop then it's like i can like kind of rest for a minute and then it's like okay like what what did i just make and then i can kind of figure it out but i don't know i feel like i'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and just going from the gut and what happens happens mm -hmm. uh were you done, Gavin? Okay, cool. Microphone <laughs> off. I didn't interrupt you. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, my my series was a purposeful experiment. So, like you know, um, it was semi improvised. Um, there were, like I said, seven different filmmaker teams, and the idea was not none of them were going to be able to see the other aspects of the film until the screening almost like a one take super eight like they saw their own film right but it was up to me to make sure that they were that they made some sort of sense in between and um <clears throat> and that was super exciting for me as much as like as as much control in some ways i had just with the idea and the story and that sort of thing i just trusted each of these filmmakers and was excited to see what they would do with the material that we developed together and um and so it was always intended to change. I was never supposed to exactly know how it ended up at the end. In fact, a couple of the films, for example, um, Eric Hill, who did uh, the first segment for the Hello Song segment, um, you know, he and I had done some silly things like for multinational beer, he'd like done a couple of like beer commercials and I acted in them and we kind of like made it up as we went along pretending it was a, a Maya Darif, Darren film like oh the, <laughs> the veil is so thin between worlds but this beer is so good and um and <laughs> and so we just kind of like took that that sense of uh play and like you know improvised half of what we did for that film um but you know at the same time we had like a call sheet for the actors and like had <laughs> to like we had 72 hours to do the thing and shot for eight, 18 hours a day and that kind of thing, you know? Um, and then there were like an Sunny Adams who did a paper animation. Um, it took like her, at, like I think three months and I would just see tiny excerpts every now and then after we'd done these, the initial set of photographs that she cut out and animated. Um, so it was like, it was cool. It was, sorry, I'm going long, but I could just say so much about each of them because it's like we made seven films. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, and, uh, and it was, it was, uh, we didn't know how it was going to end and it ended the way it did. And uh, it was, it was a really good learning experience and I'm really proud of it. Like everybody involved, they really put their heart and soul into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, that's a really great way, I think, to kind of end the panel here today. Um, thank you all very much for joining me this evening. Um,
my plug to everybody watching is obviously you can check out all of these amazing talented filmmakers at the CIFAs this Saturday, uh, November 28th, starting at 7 p.m. will be live streamed. Uh, you can go to www.cifa.com to check out the live stream and see all the nominated um, filmmakers um, and for both the web series, feature film, short film, student film categories um, as well. So thank you all very much for joining me this evening and I hope you all have a wonderful evening and have a great time on Saturday. Thanks thank guys. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thanks.